Hello, my name is Jodeci. I'm Alexis. And I'm Jeffrey. And welcome to this presentation on ethics and research training. Today, we'll explore a critical aspect of conducting ethical research, how we interact with and respect the people who participate in our studies, specifically in the context of community-based participatory research, or CBPR, and surveying. When we engage in research that involves human subjects, it is our responsibility to ensure that we approach this work with the highest ethical standards. This means not only being aware of potential biases that can arise in the surveying process, but also recognizing how these biases can lead to harmful consequences, both for the individuals and communities. Surveys that are designed or conducted without care for inclusivity or fairness can inadvertently marginalize, stigmatize, or misrepresent the people whose voices we are trying to capture. Furthermore, a key component of ethical research is protecting the privacy and confidentiality of those we survey. As researchers, we often handle sensitive information, and it is our duty to ensure that this information is safeguarded. Failing to do so can erode trust, discourage participation, and ultimately undermine the integrity of our research. One preventative practice we will learn about is reflexivity, which I'll review with you later in this presentation. In this presentation, we'll cover the core principles of research ethics that govern research with participants and examine how surveys can be conducted with care to avoid bias and emphasize the importance of protecting the privacy of all participants. Um, the work of Eclipse is crucial in creating a future where all California students are equipped with the knowledge and tools to address climate change. In the context of ethics and research, ensuring that student learning, community engagement, and environmental data collection are carried out with integrity and respect for privacy and a commitment to social justice is fundamental. Eclipse's effort to build climate literacy involved gathering data, from diverse communities, making it vital that the principles of ethical research guide their approach to ensure inclusivity, protect participant confidentiality, and avoid harm, especially in underserved communities. The work we must do not only must not only advance our environmental understanding, but also respect and uplift the communities involved. Now let's take a look at our learning objective for today's discussion on ethics and research. So understanding social justice and research, you'll learn how to define social justice and research, promote fairness, address social inequalities, and recognize the importance of maintaining objectivity, especially when emotionally invested in topics like climate change. Incorporating social justice principles. We'll discuss how we try to ensure diverse representation in research and understand the potential impact on marginalized groups. Practicing reflexivity in research, you'll explore reflexivity, how self-awareness can improve research quality, and address the power dynamics that influence ethical research. Hello, my name is Jodeci Weems, and I will guide us through the first learning objective which is understanding social justice in research. Most of my work is dedicated to advancing community-focused research with an emphasis on climate justice. Recently, I helped create our campus's first climate action plan and supported community climate outreach efforts as an NSF GeoBond community-based research assistant. And being able to connect the campus with the community entails special regard for promoting fairness and equity in research and giving community members a voice and ownership in method development, interpreting, and using the results of research work. I also worked alongside the Laudato Si Advocacy Program as an intern, which focused on grassroots and community outreach to promote ecological conversion and environmental justice. So before we move forward, let's take a moment to define some key terms related to social justice in research. Social justice is a concept that promotes fairness, equity, and equality, ensuring that everyone in society is treated with respect and has their rights protected. Environmental social justice focuses on the environmental advantages and disadvantages that different communities experience, which highlights how these are distributed unevenly across society. And understanding these definitions underscores the importance of integrating social justice into research, and it ensures equal opportunities fair treatment and respect for all participants, 
particularly in studies that address environmental and societal issues. An essential part of ethical research is building strong relationships with communities. This involves community partnership, where collaborating with local leaders and organizations fosters trust and encourages participation. And a great example of this is when I worked alongside Fresno State in collaboration with the city of Fresno, assisting in their climate adaptation plan for the city. We were able to talk with community members and gain personal experience and perspective on the environmental issues that people within the community want to see changes in. So when planning events for community members, Flexibility is key and offering different ways for people to engage, such as providing childcare at events or offering transportation or even allowing virtual participation. These efforts ensure that everyone feels welcomed and supported and ultimately creates lasting relationships with the community. And this helps to ensure that research is inclusive, respectful and beneficial to everyone that's involved. So let's take a closer look at the role of emotional investment in social justice research. Often, researchers build a personal connection to their topic, which can drive passion and commitment. This is particularly true in climate research, where personal ties to affected communities can create a strong sense of urgency. However, emotional investment can also lead to bias in data interpretation. Researchers may unintentionally focus on findings that align more with their personal beliefs rather than approaching the research with complete objectivity, which can affect the credibility of results. And how to identify emotional interference um, in research through self-reflection. It's essential to assess ourselves and ask critical questions like, are my conclusions based on evidence or are they influenced by my own personal beliefs? One way to maintain objectivity is through mindful practice. So actively seek out differing perspectives and constructive criticism from colleagues and peers. Feedback from others can help identify potential biases that might affect the research, ensuring that decisions are driven by evidence rather than emotions. And we'll review more of this practice with Alexis towards the end of our presentation. Marginalized communities often face disproportionate effects of climate change, such as increased vulnerability to urban heat islands or flooding due to changing weather patterns. So it's crucial to involve these communities in research as doing so empowers their voices and integrates their unique knowledge into creating climate solutions. And a great example of this work is Keyshawn White, who is a young climate leader from the Southeast, from Southeast Fresno and has launched an initiative to promote cleaner air. His efforts demonstrate how community-driven action can make a significant impact in addressing environmental challenges. And here's a video um, to share with you about some of the work that he's done within the city. The young Fresno man is on a mission. His goal, to teach families about how air quality affects their health. Uh, he's placed air quality monitors at Fresno schools and churches and even developed an app, but now some of those monitors have been vandalized. From afar, this device resembles a surveillance camera. But if you take a closer look, you'll see there's more going on. We also know where um, the main sources of pollution is coming from and also for how long the pollution has been pretty much around. This is one of 13 air quality monitors 18-year-old Kishan White has put up around Fresno. These monitor fine particles in the air, smaller than a human hair, about 200 times smaller than a grain of sand at school sites and churches. Compare that to the four regulatory grade monitors put up by the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District, the monitor ozone in the Fresno and Clovis area. For White, this is a passion project with a purpose. I live not too far from here on the southwest area and also suffer from um, respiratory issues. So pretty much I wanted to figure out what I was breathing and what it was doing to my body. He was diagnosed with asthma at the age of 11. Factories, farms, and highways aren't too far away. We started this project with him two years ago. While I was teaching him how to code and Java and HTML, and I challenged him to um, think of a project that would help his community, and he came up with this. At first, he used a drone to check the air. Then he and his mentor got grants to buy the monitors. By May, he and a team launched an app so families could check those monitors and start a conversation about what the bad air does to their bodies, no matter where they live. 
kind of hard to engage into a conversation that you don't know too much about. The data could be used to compare the air quality in different parts of town and possibly shape policies. But in the past few weeks, five of those monitors have been vandalized. The power cord was stolen from this monitor and it's outside of a church. Some monitors have been destroyed altogether. When the grant fund ends, it ends, so we didn't, we didn't calculate that. So I've, I've had to come out of pocket for a lot of the damage. Every type of project or any type of mission you want to say, there's going to be a type of roads or speed bumps there. You just got to work past. Not discouraged, but determined. A white was even recognized for his work by attending a conference with President Obama earlier this year. He hopes to eventually raise enough money to put one air quality monitor for each square mile of the city. Monty, that would be 100 15 monitors, wow. and he's hoping to eventually get a GoFundMe page set up to help raise that money. You have to admire his passion and what he's trying to do. Yeah, and it just stinks because, again, the cord is what people keep stealing from these. That cord just happens to be compatible with Android phones. But this is a heavy-duty cord that is meant to be outside because, again, they have to plug it to a power source. They'll get through this. I'd yeah, so we'll let you know if in case they do set up a GoFundMe page, I'll share that information with mm -hmm. you, and hopefully we can help them meet that goal. Absolutely. Though Keyshawn was not able to join us today, we wanted to highlight the work he's done for his community and exemplify how community-driven work influences change in relation to environmental justice. Not only has Keyshawn helped his community with air quality monitoring, but he's also led climate action strikes to bring awareness to air pollution and founded his organization, Healthy Fresno Air. He's still working on bringing change as he's just launched his initiative for his 2030 campaign to establish low emission zones in Fresno, with the goal of reducing air pollution in the city by 2030. Now, this is important. This is an important aspect of environmental justice, as by supporting community members who understand firsthand the problems their communities are facing is essential to researchers' knowledge. Ethical responsibilities in research are essential to ensure that all participants are treated with fairness, respect, and integrity. And by conducting research with accuracy and avoiding bias, Scientists can use their findings to advocate for environmental policies and justice initiatives. Prioritizing research that addresses real world issues allows us to balance academic goals with social responsibility. And this helps to ensure that the work we do has a meaningful impact on society, especially in addressing critical environmental challenges. And here is a diagram to show the framework of ethical research practices one can take to ensure research is done responsibly. So some different types of biases um, can significantly affect the quality of research. So sampling bias occurs when the sample doesn't represent the broader population. And a perfect example is when the city held a climate action survey on the same day as a community event at the fairgrounds. And instead of moving to where the community was, the city stayed at their original location, missing valuable input. There's also questionnaire bias, which happens when questions lead respondents to specific answers, and response bias occurs when participants provide socially desirable answers instead of their true opinions. And these biases produce inaccurate data, which lead to flawed conclusions and potentially harmful decisions. For instance, decision based on bias can marginalize communities or even reinforce harmful stereotypes, raising significant ethical concerns. And now to share a concrete example of how we work together to minimize these risks and protect our community members, I'd like to introduce Jeffrey. Thank you, Jodeci. So hi, my name is Jeffrey Thibodeau and I serve on the College of Science and Mathematics uh, Dean Student Advisory Council or DSAC, uh, helping our college with STEM persistence. And also I serve as an NSF Geobond Community-Based Research Assistant or CBRA, helping with uh, climate outreach and building community connected climate action research projects that bring together community members with faculty and students. In this module, I will share how we use city research, ethics, compliance, and safety training to support our first year students in their projects. So the city program or collaborative institutional training initiative is an online web-based course that offers high quality peer-reviewed online courses to train individuals in research, ethics, regulatory oversight, responsible conducts of research, 
and research administration. And then you can see on the left, when completing this curriculum, you will receive that certification that verifies that you are city certified. And that lasts for three years. So why do we need the city program? Well, it promotes research integrity. It teaches best practices in responsible conducts of research, like preventing misconduct and plagiarism and falsification, ensuring ethical compliance. Many research areas, especially those with human subjects, require ethical training to comply with legal and institutional guidelines. Meeting regulatory requirements. Institutions often require city certification to meet federal and organizational regulations for research funding and project approval. Protecting participants and data. It emphasizes the protection of research subjects and data security reducing risks to both participants and researchers. And finally, standardizing training. City provides a standardized curriculum ensuring consistent training across all institutions. So in our first year experience of BOND, which is building opportunities through networks of discovery, as you can see on the left, um, a class of students work diligently to develop research surveys for their community. They all completed city training to ensure that their questions were ethical, professional, and built on trust, all with the guidance of a professor. The students added new questions to already existing surveys, topics like mental health, coral bleaching, food deserts, and more, and were given time to use their training to reflect on how their biases their own biases can potentially influence their research. Only students with city training and city certification could access or analyze the data, ensuring the research met ethical standards, even double checking surveys to make sure they are not biased and follow the conduct of research from the overseeing professor helping out and other instructional student assistants, like teacher's assistants, but they're specific to this first year experience, and giving feedback and changing the question slightly. Now, to explore more specifically how we reflect on our roles and biases in research, Alexis will review the concept of reflexivity in research. Thank you, Jeffrey, for sharing that insightful example. My name is Alexis Valadez, and I've just begun my graduate work building on the climate action service learning and research I did as an undergraduate. During my junior and senior years, I completed over a thousand hours of service, bringing together community-based organizations and Fresno State to start collection, collective climate action. Along with Jodeci and Jeffrey, I serve as a community-based research assistant. From my background in service learning, I'll help you understand the critical role of reflexivity in our work. Reflexivity is a critical concept in research, referring to the process of examining your own role and influence in the research process. Its importance lies in several key areas. It promotes transparency, allowing others to see your research and provide feedback, strengthening your research. Reflexivity encourages self-awareness, helping you recognize your own assumptions and beliefs. Finally, it helps in acknowledging and mitigating personal biases improving objectivity and validity of your research. By practicing reflexivity, we can conduct more ethical and credible research. Now that we understand the importance of reflexivity, let's explore three practical techniques. The first, journaling. Writing regularly about your thoughts and biases during the research process helps you remain aware of your assumptions. Reflexivity layers onto reflection, looking outwards towards your influence on different com components of the research process. Another effective practice is peer debriefing. Discussing your approach with colleagues offers fresh perspectives and helps identify and work through blind spots. And third, incorporating participant voices. Including these perspectives ensures fairness and reduces the influence of researcher bias, enabling research to understand needs and guide effective action. These techniques allow us to continuously refine our approach and increase the credibility of our research. Reflexivity is recognizing how we shape research. Let's dive into that next. Our identity 
cultural background, gender, socioeconomic status, professional experience, and other things affect how we conduct research. It can shape the questions we ask, how we interpret data, and how we interact with participants. For example, I once helped the city survey a community on adding a bike path. In going door to door, I found three crucial items that would have improved the surveying quality if reflexivity was used. The first is language. And often it is the case that language may be difficult to understand, but this one was only provided in English. So if you spoke any other language, your voice was not collected. The second, well, this is what it felt like. The surveying was only quantitative questions, providing only yes or no answer choices. So it felt like I was getting my point across, but not theirs, because they could not provide any depth. I found that a lot of people had an important why to share. And this insight is invaluable when investing in community because they provide perspective into what works, what won't, public concerns, and possibly what to fix instead. The third is that the research lacked adaptability. The bypass was going to be built and the survey was a way to invite people to the next planning meeting. This speaks on power dynamics between researchers and something they want to quote unquote save. In other words, researchers have a bias towards thinking they know what's best. And it is this dynamic that when unchecked does not consider participant voices, create solutions that don't work and ultimately waste a lot of time and energy. So when collecting data, ask yourself, how is this representative of what is actually happening? Now let's look at how reflexivity improves research quality and addresses key ethical issues. Reflexivity is crucial for improving objectivity, validity, and transparency in research. It enhances objectivity by helping us recognize and mitigate biases, validity through transparent reporting of our influence on the study, and reliability and replicability by clearly documenting the context of our research. Integrating reflexivity into our research not only strengthens our findings, but also ensures we approach our work with fairness, transparency, and respect for all participants. To wrap up, we've covered three components of our discussion today. Social justice in research, highlighting the importance of equity and fairness. Social justice principles, sharing some of our own work towards emphasizing diverse representation and ethical responsibility. And reflexivity in research, ensuring we are mindful of our biases and power dynamics through the research process. On behalf of myself, Jodeci, Jeffrey, and Kishan, I wanna thank you for joining us. We hope to see socially just climate action research from all of you soon. Goodbye, and thank you all for your upcoming socially just work.